You're listening to KZSC's Voces Críticas, Critical Voices. I am your producer and host, Silvana Falcón. Today I'm here with Cindy Cruz, Associate Professor in the Department of Education here at UC Santa Cruz. Her research is focused on LGBTQ street youth narratives and experiences, including homeless, queer, and trans youth in Los Angeles, California. She was a high school English teacher and HIV counselor for many years, and this work experience greatly influences her research today. Professor Cruz uses U.S. feminism of color and decolonial feminist theories to analyze youth narratives and their experiences. She is also the co-editor of Frontiers, a journal of women's studies. Welcome, Cindy, to KZSC's Voces Criticas. Thank you, Silvana. Let's talk about how you arrived to this research agenda. Sometimes the research finds us. What has drawn you to this research focus on homeless youth, and why is it so important to you? After the 1992 Los Angeles uprisings, I had just started teaching in LA Unified Continuation Schools. And part of your job as a teacher in continuation schools, where you kind of teach everything, has been you get on the phone after class and you call students who are absent that day. So in this job, this kind of new job where I'm working at two continuation schools in Los Angeles, One that's focused on, I guess in some ways, the flashpoint of Los Angeles at Normandy and Manchester, and also this LGBTQ kind of special project of LA Unified that was supposed to help recoup all these LGBTQ students who had dropped out of their comprehensive high schools. So my job on the phone is to find out, oh, how come you weren't absent? Please come to school the next day. We need you here. And so when I would call, no answer, phone disconnected, address didn't work. Sometimes I'd go do house visits. Nobody would know where the family was, things like that. And slowly I was beginning to realize that so many of the students that were in particular at the LGBTQ continuation school and at the school in South Central Los Angeles, so many of them were homeless. And that homelessness meant this kind of transient couch surfing, living with friends, tias. I had one student deported. He walked back to Los Angeles. And I was slowly beginning to realize that maybe more than 50% of my students were either unsheltered, foster care, or really just like this unstable housing situations. And so part of the experience for youth of being homeless in Los Angeles is this constant movement. So much of youth shelters, these kind of continuation schools, the L.A. Children's Hospital has its own kind of uh, youth homelessness and kind of precarity unit. All of these things are clustered all within just a few miles of each other in Hollywood, California. Most adult services happen in downtown And so let's unpack a bit the category of youth and specifically what age groups are you talking about? You mentioned students. It sounds like you're mostly talking about high school students, but if you could clarify a bit when you're using the term youth, is there a particular age range that you're focused on? You know, most of the social services and the official counts of homeless use youth as a category 18 to 24 years of age. In my own research, I wanted to talk to 12 to 21 years of age students. You know, there's no real good definition of what youth is in this country. I've seen studies where somebody was looking at 30-year-olds and they were calling them youth. And so part of my work is due to IRB restrictions on the kind of research that I can ask people, I talk to young people between the ages of 14 to 21 years old. All of my research is anonymous. And so I never ask for any names or identifying information from any of the youth that I talk to. It protects them and it protects me in some sense. And I want young people to feel free to kind of tell these stories of what life has been like on the street. And so that category of youth is really tenable because for some youth, like if you're undocumented, then as soon as you turn 18, you haven't just moved out of that youth category. Now you're a deportable adult. And that's a whole new category of adult or youth. or I don't even know what to call that. You'd mentioned IRB, and I just want to clarify for our listeners that IRB stands for the Institutional Review Board. Faculty have are required to go through an IRB process in order to protect, ideally, the participants of our research as well as the scholar engaged in the research and probably, in large part, also the university as well. Cindy, could you speak a little bit about the ways in which gentrification is not only affecting Los Angeles, but also affecting a place like San Francisco? In Los Angeles, gentrification has happened so quickly in the last, I don't know, 15 years. I think part of what gentrification does is that it moves people. Not only is it now 
this issue of houselessness because you can't afford rents or find an affordable place to live in Los Angeles as you cannot find an affordable place to live in San Francisco. And so it disperses people in these really interesting ways. And so for homelessness, now you get pushed into all these other areas. Gentrification has made it so hard to create a group home, to create transitional housing. This gentrification is constantly pushing you to maneuver through the city. And so you have to be mobile. I think part of the issue of mobility is, are you able to afford a bus pass? If you're not able to be mobile, then eventually you're going to be picked up for loitering or vagrancy. Like most social service centers in Los Angeles, there's usually security guards that kind of mind who comes and goes in all of these centers. This collision with police, that is the problematic thing, I think, at this time. We can't solve these kinds of homeless problems with putting people in county jail. You're listening to Dr. Cindy Cruz, Associate Professor in the Department of Education here at UC Santa Cruz. Her research is focused on LGBTQ street youth narratives and experiences, including homeless, queer, and trans youth. So let's pick up on what you just left off in terms of jails is not the solution here for homelessness. Is developing more youth shelters and group homes enough, though? And what has to be done here? So many of the youth that I've met in this research, they have come from foster care, The foster care system, overloaded, understaffed, that is like a huge issue in the U.S. So many LGBTQ youth, they didn't leave home because someone said, get out of my house, my gay son, I don't want you in my house, or some sort of fundamentalist parent said, leave. Most of the stories that young people told me were of your family unit, basic structure, has fallen apart, and you end up in the foster care system, or you end up staying with friends, the couch surfing, all that. You end up being houseless that basic family kind of falling apart. I think that's part of a larger infrastructural problem in the U.S. where we're not able to fund, house, or adequately kind of like support families to kind of stay together, jobs, things like that. And also families when they end up in hotels and motels for extended stays, that's also becomes like the beginning of that end. I thought initially when my research happened that it was going to be, oh, my fundamentalist father threw me out. No, it is that the economic conditions of the family have just kind of dissolved. And so youth are kind of left on their own. What kind of intervention are you hoping that your research makes and how we talk about homeless youth and the kind of public policies being proposed in cities throughout the U.S., Los Angeles and beyond? We all hope our research makes a difference in the world. What are you hoping your research does? I have several things that I'd like my research to do. And one is just to kind of recognize the vast numbers of young people in our classrooms, in our hospitals, in all these kinds of public spaces, how many of them are at this precarity of houselessness. I also would like my research to touch upon social science research. I feel like we're not asking the right kinds of questions. And so most of the youth in Los Angeles, they're youth of color. They're youth of color or they're undocumented youth. It's not just undocumented from Mexico or Central America. These are undocumented youth from Eastern Europe. And there's also this issue of the traffic of youth. And that traffic of youth has been something that we're not aware of. We haven't asked those kinds of questions. But we also haven't asked these questions where race and gender and citizenship, all those things become compounded for some of these youth. And I think that we have to be able to ask some of these questions a little bit more thoroughly in our social science research. When I've looked at other research on homeless youth, in particular, its impact on schools, sometimes race isn't even talked about. Or if I'm looking at other kinds of research, people aren't even asking about trans youth. Part of youth homelessness part that goes hand in hand with this kind of experience of living on the street is survival sex. And so there's this huge exchange of a body for your room, board, food, a shower. You hope that someone keeps you in their apartment or their place for a few days. And so this this huge exchange of youth bodies for basic necessities. Part of, I think, the problem of gentrification and this movement of youth because of the gentrification, I think it makes it harder to do these counts. It makes it harder to do these kind of interventions. And it makes it harder to do really some basic public health education. And that is a huge problem, I think, right now. After 9-11, so much of health education kind of shifted to other areas, and it really moved away from HIV. The people who are beginning to contract HIV, the numbers are going back up to the pre-90 levels, in particular with Black and Latino male homeless youth. And that, to me, is 
It's a social emergency at this time, especially in Los Angeles. It's a similar issues in San Francisco. When I drive through there, I've just amazed at the amount of homelessness in both Los Angeles and in San Francisco. And our city's infrastructure is unable to handle it or it doesn't want to. You know, a few years ago in the Castro, they wanted to put a youth group home there, like a kind of large one, you know, that held like 24 youth. And the Castro district, they voted it down, like they refused to put that youth services and youth group home in the Castro, where you think, oh, the Castro used to be the bedrock of LGBTQ politics in San Francisco. And I'm always amazed at the different kinds of politics and the different kind of ways cities have dealt with it. I think in Los Angeles, you try to contain it. You contain it to certain kinds of neighborhoods in Los Angeles, but you can't because the numbers are so huge. I saw a number of 2017, the count was 52,000 people on the street, more than 52,000 people on the street in Los Angeles. And although those numbers had gone down this last year, what has gone up has been elderly homeless in the city of Los Angeles. San Francisco, the numbers are not as big as LA, but it's way more visible. And I think it's way more of like a street war that happens between the police in San Francisco and the homeless homeless there. Part of the visibility of homelessness is also kind of like this big resistance that homeless folks are doing in San Francisco. In Los Angeles is this containment of these homeless bodies, including youth bodies, hence the mobility. So as researchers who delve into these really difficult subject matters that involve pain and involve trauma and involve violence and so forth, how does this research affect you personally? And what do you do to sort of care for your own self? Sometimes talking with youth, it's a very emotional process. I've always tried to be present and alert and there for young people because I really do want to know what's going on in your head. And nobody ever asks youth, what are they thinking? How was your day? Like, I really want to know, like, how has your day been? So part of my research, I always carry meal vouchers. So I get research monies and I buy a whole bunch of meal vouchers that are in and out. That's easy. You give youth two vouchers so you could take a friend to go eat someplace. I always pay my youth when I talk with them. I really wanted to give them cash, but none of the social service agencies that I work with wanted me to do that. They wanted gift cards. So now I buy gift cards, but it's still fast food vouchers and a gift card is what I try to give them. So much of, of my own work has been very, very emotional. And so, you know, I grew up in a place where I've kind of seen a lot of trauma and violence, you know, where I grew up in Fontana, California. And so when I've seen this with youth, I kind of know what I'm looking at, I think pretty accurately. At least I try to think that I'm accurate about what I'm seeing in the story that I'm listening to. Sometimes those kinds of stories, they don't affect me until days later. So I might have heard a really traumatic story. And being the ethnographer, I write it all down. And then later on, I type it all up. And I put it away and I look at what is it that this young person just told me? Is this a story of trafficking? Did you witness a very violent crime? One story really affected me was of a young woman who had been going to one of the schools that I had been working at. And she told a story of witnessing a very violent incident of a trans woman in downtown Los Angeles. You know, sometimes I listen to those stories and I put it aside and I don't because I don't know what to do with it. And so one day I was cruising the net and I found that... Transgender Day of Remembrance webpage. It's so interesting because just recently someone had uh, at a conference had challenged how I was doing my research because how did I know what youth were telling me was the truth? So when I went on this Transgender Day of Remembrance page, I clicked on one of the this little candle and you click on it and it tells the story of a death of a transgender woman. And the story I could tell was the same story that this youth told me. And I just kind of like, it just, this this huge kind of like flood of emotions happens when I think, oh my God, what are these young people like? What are they witnessing? What are they witness to in Los Angeles? And sometimes when I meet parents, I often think, now I know why you've run away from home or you've left home. And part of that has to be for your own mental, physical, or sexual health. Are there moments where you feel like I need to step away for a little bit just to regroup? What are some of the strategies or methods you use just to remain present? I just finished teaching an advanced qualitative analysis class. And one of the things that I told my graduate students is to do this kind of research, in particular with youth or with vulnerable populations, is that you need to be present. You need to be healthy. You need to be able to be aware, awake, not hungry. You have to be able to give this person that you're talking to your complete attention. And that's exhausting. 
I think part of also what I've told my graduate students and what I try to do as a researcher is I do a lot of de-stressing. I do a lot of like writing, of writing out kind of my own emotions and working with these vulnerable populations. I go work out. I go kick a ball around. It's been a thing to relieve myself of this massive stress that sometimes accumulates in an interview. And also, you can't do this kind of interview for a long time, right? You can't do this kind of work, I think, for a long time with periods of time. So now it's been more of a going into Los Angeles to hang out for a few weeks at the youth center and talk with youth and hang out and then to move away. So many of the young people that I work with, they carry these huge journals, those art bound journals. They write on every square inch of the paper, even like the margins. And they're all kind of bound with tape or with rubber bands. And so I realized like so many young people are trying to write about their experiences to try to figure out a way to talk about what has happened to them. Like writing is their way of trying to understand. I was thinking about like, it'd be so cool to work with an artist, to work with an artist that could help them rethink some of this narrative that they're writing down, to rethink their experiences so so they can revise and see themselves as resilient, as filled with agency, as Maria Lagona says, survivor rich. I want them to see that part of themselves. And so I think part of my self-help too is not to collect these stories of oppression, It is to collect, to flip that, to reframe that, and to see these stories as resistance. I'm sort of struck by the writing that the youth are keeping as their form, in some ways, like yourself, of release, of dealing with sort of the pressures of the life and the lived experience. I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us today, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to share any final comments you might have. I think the homeless issue in the state of California, in the United States, it is a huge kind of failure of our infrastructure. And part of that has to do with a kind of a reevaluation of people who vote about what you're voting for and why. We can't continue to play this anti-tax standpoint in California politics in the United States. We have to figure out how we're going to do this. And I know it's complicated. And yet I think that we need to invest in that next generation. We need to invest in our infrastructure for the health of the U.S., but in particular, the health of youth. Well, thank you so much, Cindy, for spending some time with us. It was great talking to you. Thank you, Silvana.